Amen. Recording is started. Okay. So today uh, we will be co covering two letters on the letter to James and letter first and second Peter. We will take the first and second hour. Request you all to please turn to the letter to James. So we completed Hebrews in the last class, and this class will be studying on the letter to James. I will share the presentation. Give me a minute. So what do we know on the book of James? In short, the letter to James is also known as the book of practical Christianity. Previously, James was an unbeliever. And now he has become the pillar of the church, who is a pious, devout man and uh, with an exemplary Christian character. When we look at his life, he seemed to uh, have lived the doctrine that he preached in the letter. So this letter to James was written to the Jewish Christians who are scattered among the nation because of the persecution that was there during those days related to the faith. So he writes this letter to them. So when we, when we look at James, in English, the word for James, is called, in Greek it is called as Jacobos. So we look in the Greek, we see that his name was Jacobos, which Hebrew name Yahoo. This James is to be notable from the other man by the name James in the New Testament. So when we read the New Testament, we will come across three James. Three James. Let me share the presentation. Yeah, so this first James, whom we are going to talk about, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 21. He is the James, a son of Zebedee, the, or he is also known as James the Great. If any, any of you have turned to Matthew, chapter 4, verse 21, can I request you all to read? Okay, please keep the scriptures ready. Uh, the other person can keep Mark 15, verse 40 to 41. So let me read Matthew 4, 21. What it says is, going on from there, he saw two brothers, two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. So here we see James and John were the sons of Zebedee. And he was the cousin of Jesus. And this James' mother was called as Salome, who was the sister of Mary. And he was one of the three in Jesus' inner circle, like James, John, and Peter. And James was also addressed as the great or big James because he is mentioned far more than the other disciples among the name 
James. So James was a son of Zebedee, was the first of the 12 apostles to be martyred when he was killed by Herod Agrippa in about um, approximately 44 AD, as per the book of Acts chapter 12. Now, as we discussed on James, and they were also known as, James and John were also known as sons of thunder. They were nicknamed by Jesus as sons of thunder. And now next, we will talk about the James who was the son of Alpheus. James, the son of Alpheus, he is also known as James the Less. If any of you have turned to Mark chapter 15, verse 40 and 41, can I request you to please read? Mark chapter 15, verse 40 to 41. Some women there were there looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of the younger James, and of Joseph, and Salome. They had followed Jesus while he was in Galilee, and had helped him. Many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him were there also. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So the scripture talks about this James, who was a son of Alphaeus, or James the Less. James was a son of Alphaeus, and he was also numbered among the 12 disciples. He may have been related to Matthew, because even Matthew's father was Alphaeus. So little is known of this man, but the tradition suggests that he was also stoned by the unbelieving Jews for preaching Jesus Christ. Now, next we will come across James, who was the brother of Jesus, was the son of Mary and Joseph, and half brother of Jesus. So he is sometimes referred as James the Just. That was his historical literature name. He was most likely the eldest son of Mary and Joseph and the brother of Jesus. So he is usually addressed or listed first in any of the references. Can I request you all to please turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 verse 55 to 56. Can any of you all please read Matthew? 13, 1, 3, verse 55 to 56. Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simeon, Simon, and Judas his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living there? Where did he get all this? Thank you, thank you. So if you see the list of the brothers they have listed according to their age wise. So you see the other siblings in the family includes Joseph, Joseph possibly as uh, Joseph. Okay, so it is first as James, then Joseph, Simon and Judas. And after that, we see the unnamed sisters who have been listed. So he was not numbered among the 12 apostles of the Lamb. He was not listed among, whereas the other two James were among the 12 disciples. But this James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, was not numbered among the 12 disciples. Well, he traveled with Jesus on various occasions with his other brother. So that has been listed in the Gospel of John. Can I request you to turn to John chapter 2? Verse 12, you can read 11 and 12. John chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. This beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum 
he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Thank you. So we see here that his family has accompanied Jesus on various occasions with the other disciples. And later, we also see that James and his brothers were not totally convinced about the calling and the mission that Jesus carried in his ministry. Can I request you all to turn to John chapter 7, verse 3 to 5. John 7, verse 3 to 5. John chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. So Jesus' brother said to him, Leave this place and go to Judea, so that your followers will see the things that you are doing. No one hides what he is doing if he wants to be well known. Since you are doing these things, let the whole world know about you. Not even his brothers believed in him. Amen. Amen. Here in King James Version, we see that it says, For even his brothers did not believe in him. Verse 5. So even his brothers did not, were not totally convinced about the calling and ministry that Jesus was doing in his early days. And later we also see that James was attentive to the teaching of Jesus, which is reflected in his obvious knowledge of the Sermon on Mount. So many things that James addresses in this letter were from the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus. Said. We also see in John 19 verse 25 to 27, he was noticeably absent from the foot of the cross at the Jesus crucifixion because, um, uh, you know, the scripture says that now they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Women, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own house. Because of, you know, uh, Jesus did this because none of his brothers were available at the cross. And he saw his beloved disciple, John, who was faithfully following Jesus, even to the crucifixion, whereas even the other disciples ran away with fear. And here you see Jesus handing over his mother to the disciple uh, John's care, to the disciple John's care. We also see in John chapter 20, verse 17, that James was one of the first to receive the message of Christ's resurrection. Can I request you all to turn to John chapter 20, verse 17? Please, if anyone have taken, please read. Also, can you repeat the scripture? Yeah. John chapter 20, 2 0, verse 17. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Thank you. So he was the one of the first to receive the message of Christ's resurrection. And later part, we also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5 to 7, mentions that he had a personal encounter with the risen Christ. And later in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 14, can I request you all to please read Acts chapter 1 verse 14. Acts 
Okay, for the time constraint, I'll read. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And with his brothers. So what we see here is that James was also present with the 120 uh, who were present in the upper room anticipating uh, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. James was also referred by Apostle Paul in the book of, in the letter to Galatians. Um, you know, we see that he was, uh, okay, let me turn to Galatians chapter 1. You're reading the scripture so that we know that he's been part of the ministry along with the disciples. J um, Galatians chapter 1 verse 18 and 19. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 14 days. But I did not see another one of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. So we we see that he was referred by Apostle Paul in the scripture, and he was eventually ascended to the senior leader leadership position in the Jerusalem Church Council. Can I request you all to turn to Acts chapter 12? Acts chapter 12, verse 17. And 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 what seven what was seventeen? Seventeen one seven. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he de he declared to them how the Lord had the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, "Go tell these things to James and to the brethren." And he departed and went to another place. Can I also request all to turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat, with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing to tho fearing those who were of the circumcision. Thank you, thank you very much. So what we see here is we see that James grew into a senior leadership position at the Church of Jerusalem. We also see that in when we read the book of Acts chapter 15 and 16, we see that James was instrumental in writing certain degree and sent out these, uh, these in the form of a letter to the Gentile churches from the Jerusalem Council. We also see that he achieved the high status of that of a born servant in Jesus Christ. When you read James chapter 1, verse 1, he says that James, the born servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see that he, he, he writes in relationship with Jesus saying that I am a born servant of God and of Lord Jesus Christ. So his perspective on Jesus has changed by now. That was after the death and resurrection of Jesus. We also see, see that the scholars or the tradition suggests that he died as a martyr at the hand of Jews somewhere around 62 AD. So let's look into the background of this book. When we look at the background of this book, James identifies his audience as the 12 tribes which are 
scattered abroad. That's what we read in James chapter 1, verse 1. He addresses this letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad due to the Nero's uh, persecution, the Jews, the, um, the Christian Jewish uh, Jews were scattered. And here, James is writing a letter addressing to those people. Yeah, and he mostly writing and addressing to the spiritual Israel of God, that is those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those who have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. The occasion of this letter, when we see the occasion of this letter, uh, uh, why James, what was the specific reason why James wrote this letter, except for, uh, you know, a few scholars have addressed that. He, he, he had this pastoral concern, caring for those under the spiritual influence that they were, uh, under the spiritual influence of James. So he is addressing this letter to the Christian believers or to the Jewish Christian believers. The date of this letter seemed to be approximately 45 to 50 AD. So let's look into the main message of the book of James or the central message. What does this book talk about? It addresses certain things. Let me change the slide. Yeah. This is James chapter 1, verse 19 to 27. When we read, it talks about some qualities needed during the times of trial. So in this section, we see that James deals with the self-deception. Yes, the self-deception that can occur when we think that the knowing the truth is the same thing as practicing the truth. We have to do more than the talk that we talk because our religion must reach into a practical side of life. Therefore, he's just trying to make a point here when we read uh, verse 26 and 27. I'll read it for all. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, uh, bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And also, same chapter, verse 17, he says, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from God, from the Father of lights. No, no, sorry. Um, James chapter 4, 17, yeah. He says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So here, James is addressing on the practical side. It is so very important to the one who knows what is truth and to put it in a practical side in his life. We need to practice what he's been teaching. And also he goes to the next step in chapter 2, verse 14 to 26, chapter 14, sorry, chapter 2, verse 14 to 26, he addresses faith without work is dead. So in this passage, James make it, makes it very clear by saying, you have faith and just having faith is not enough. One must authentic authenticate that is one must justify their faith with action that corresponds to his or her's confession very important 
So here we see James chapter 2, verse 21. Uh, he says, uh, was not Abraham a father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? And uh, and uh, and even in uh, John chapter 8, verse 39, we see that they answered and said to him, Abraham is a father. And Jesus said to him, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. See, again and again. So you need to work. Now, keep up the faith. What does it, you know... Um, James chapter 2 verse 14, James is making it very clear. He's asking a question to the people in the church. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? 70, verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have work, is dead. So very importantly, um, he's bringing the truth. He's bringing the truth. James being the leader in the main Jerusalem church, he's bringing the truth to the church by saying, just faith alone is not enough. Faith need to be accompanied by the action of what you have been sharing or teaching. And then some of the unique features of the book we see. Let me create the slide. Some of the unique features that uh, James brings it in this letter is the issues that are addressed by James. Now, James has been the senior pastor, and he sees and addresses some of the issues that has been brought to his notice. So some of the concern that he is trying to share in this letter is about handling temptation so james chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 when we read i'm reading from verse 2 onward my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing so as a pastor of the church, he's addressing on how to handle temptations. Likewise, further down on the same chapter 1, when we read from verse 9 to 11, he's addressing on handling riches. He is talking about the perspective of the rich and poor, and he shares a perspective on how to handle riches. Same chapter, verse 19 to 27, 19 to 27, talks about be uh, don't just be the hearers, but be the doers of, of the word of God. Just don't be the hearer, also be the doer. And later in chapter 2, as we just read, talks about the faith and the importance of actions being followed with faith because faith by itself if it does not have work is considered to be a dead faith so faith need to be followed by the action and in chapter 3 chapter 3 verse 1 to 12 he is talking about uh, or sharing his wisdom on how to tame the tongue the importance of controlling one's tongue and what tongue can do because that's one of the powerful weapon that a man has and you know that has a power to bring a fire in uh, in verse 6 it says the tongue is a fire the world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell 
So he is asking, is uh, in his teaching, he is writing in chapter 3, verse 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Nine, verse 9. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the stimulated of God. So he's saying the importance of taming the tongue because the tongue can be used to bless the Lord and the same tongue can also curse the people. How can we use this tongue for both? So we need to tame the tongue to, to make it a blessing. And he also further goes in chapter 5, verse 12, he says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. So he's saying how important our words should be. Let your words be yes to yes and no to no and do not swear on any other thing and further in chapter 3 itself from verse 13 to 18 he talks about the wisdom how important it is for us to walk in wisdom and in chapter 4 verse 1 to 17 he is addressing some of the life's concern how we should deal with carnality or the pride promotes strife and some of the topics we see that has been covered in chapter four is humility talks about being humble um, you know verse 10 he says sorry seven he says submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you and uh, verse eight he says draw near to god and he will draw near to you cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double minded verse 10 he says humble yourself in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up he's addressing certain issues in the church where there are false teachers who are promoting their teaching stirring up the people against the leaders of the church so because this was happening for uh, james who had grown up to be a senior pastor the leader in the main church at jerusalem he is trying to command people and bring a correction in their lifestyle and he is telling them with the wisdom of proverbs that has been written he's saying walk with wisdom walk with humility so that the lord may bless you and lift you in due season further down he talks about you know um when we read he talks about dealing with carnality and later in chapter 5 verse 7 to 12 he talks about how important it is to be patient and perseverance it is very important to cultivate patience so verse 8 he says be patient establish your hearts for the coming of the lord is at hand so patience is important yeah uh, further down he also shares about the knowledge of the sermon on the mount uh, he talks about uh, under Moses, God laid out the law for the children of Israel so that God's covenant people of the Old Testament is on Mount Sinai. And also under Jesus, he's comparing under Jesus, God laid the laws of the kingdom relating to the New Testament on the Sermon on the Mount where he's addressing from uh, Matthew chapter 5 to Eight. And we also see um, uh, James that lay, God lays out how the laws of the kingdom apply to the church, which is the spiritual Israel of God. We also see James talking about the process of temptation. 
the process of temptation in James chapter 1 verse 14 and 15 i'll read it but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed and when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth bring forth that so what we see here here james is trying to address on some of the instances that happen in the old testament like starting from the book of genesis itself in genesis chapter 3 verse 1 to 24 we see the tempting how eve was tempted she was tempted by the serpent and then it was combined uh, with the desire within her as she took the fruit. And what did she do? The sin was birthed by she ate and gave it to her husband. Now how all this happened and the eyes were opened. The sin was accomplished. And then what happened? The punishment. What did it bring forth? death that was she and her husband was sent out from the garden of eden likewise later part when we come to the book of samuel the second samuel chapter 11 we see how david committed how david was tempted and he committed a sin so what happened david was taking a walk he saw a woman was having bath what happened? It combined with the sexual arousement within him. And he inquired about the women and he committed a sin. And what did he do? Did he stop for that? He also went ahead to plot and kill her husband so that he can make her his own. What happened? The sin was committed. Sword was in his own household. And later, also we read in the book of Joshua about Achan. When Achan went for a war along with Joshua, he was tempted by the spoils of the war, of which God said, do not take it. But then he combined with this eye, he was so much tempted that he coveted them. He took some of them and he was forbidden from the old camp. Not only that, he was, uh, you know, he took those spoils, he hid it under the ground and later God revealed it to Joshua and Joshua burned out in anger. And, you know, eventually uh, the whole family, the household of Achan, were cast out of the city. They were stoned and burned together along with the things that they had taken. So this is what happens in every man's life. This is what James is trying to explain in chapter 1, verse 14 to 15, that, you know, man has been tempted. He's been enticed by his own lust. What happens next? Lust has been conceived and it gives birth to sin. Now it doesn't stop there. Sin accomplished. Sin is accomplished and then it brings forth death so at the first place itself when you're being tempted you need to speak the word of god because this is what the scripture says when you speak the word of god the enemy flees you can overcome the temptation by the word of god you have the power to control the temptation and later, James also talks about the heroes of the Old Testament. He talks about in chapter 2, he addresses about Abraham. Yeah, we don't have time to much dwell on each chapter, but then I just, with a little time, I'm almost finishing this letter. Yeah, he talks about some of the uh, heroes of the Old Testament. He addresses about Abraham in chapter 2, verse 21. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? So he, he says that he was a man who, who verified his faith by his works. 
And also he mentions about Isaac, his only son, was sacrificed by Abraham. It seems to, uh, to be an ultimate example of works verifying with faith. Like Abraham had this strong faith in him. God blessed me with a son, Isaac. And God's promise is to multiply my descendants. Even if God is asking me to sacrifice my son, and I know for sure he will rise him up. He will raise him up. You know, he was, he, he had the strong faith on God that made him, uh, you know, to set an example of his work. He just went on action. And same way as Abraham believed, God provided in the sacrifice. And we also see James 2.25, he talks about Rahab the harlot, also justified by works when she received the messenger and sent them out another way. So here he uh, addresses on Rahab as someone who demonstrated her faith by our actions, which resulted in the salvation of her and her family. And also in chapter 5, verse 11, we see that he is talking about Job. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful so what is he talking about he's addressing about job he seemed to be a man of perseverance through suffering now why did james talk about job in the passage because as he is addressing some correction to the jewish christians He's also addressing to the people who are being persecuted by the Nero. So by the Nero's persecution, Job is addressing to the Christians who are under the persecution, saying, look at Job, who was a man of perseverance. He went through the suffering, and at the end, God blessed him. God rewarded him for his uh, for his suffering. He says, the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So shall you be. And later in 517, he addresses on Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. So we see that... Uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, there's a power cut, I guess. Uh, it will come, it will come. Yeah, thank you. So Elijah is seen as a man who knew how to pray and believe God for the impossible things. So what is James trying to do? He's encouraging the believers to pray and expect the supernatural hand of God upon them so God can move in impossible situations. Along with it, in chapter 3, James is addressing on the tongue. James is addressing on the tongue. He, from James chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, for time being, we're not reading, but I'll just explain what, is, what it says. He says the tongue is like the bit in the horse's mouth. Though it is a very small thing, but it can control a large animal. The same way, he also uh, uh, goes ahead and compares that the tongue is like a rudder on a large ship. Though it is very small, the rudder is very small, when we compare it to the control of the direction of the whole ship. And later he also goes ahead and he says the tongue is, is like a spark fire. Tongue is like a spark of fire. It seems insignificant, but then, yes, it has a potential to destroy the entire forest, family, or a person's life. 
So yes, the tongue is more difficult for a man to handle. So what he needs to do? He needs to tame it like how he tames a wild animal. And later he also further go further um, he goes and addresses on tongue can just uh, you know it can just uh, like the venom of a snake it can just be like a venom of a snake when it's injected it can also kill its prey he also says the tongue is like a spring of water when it is pure, it produces life. But when it is stained, it brings forth death. That is nothing but Proverbs 18.21. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. Those who speak it will, have, will taste its fruit. So what you speak from this tongue, you will have the fruit of it. He also says tongue is like a fruit tree or vine from which people can eat. It can be a tree of life or a tree of death. Again, Proverbs 18, 21. So we need to be very careful on what the tongue is. So when we look at the reflection of this letter, the letter of James shows the importance of how our action should be in accordance of our faith because our actions during the trials and temptations are treatment toward the poor or toward the other person from what we speak uh, matters how we spend our money matters because that reflects the faith of what we proclaim so we need to take time and ponder as we study this letter, have a check over our life. What is our life reflecting on? Like what James is addressing some things on. He addresses in chapter one about the rich and the poor. And how are we enduring ourselves during the time of trial? Are we actually the doers of the world? And also he is talking about the faith without work is a dead faith. So can we take, uh, take a look at our own actions? Is our faith promoting the action that is corresponding to our faith? We also should uh, take a look at our language, at our tongue. Is it bringing fruit? Is it bringing life into us and to the other person? Because the scripture says, may your words be graceful so that it may encourage the person who hears it. We need to take a look. Is our words, is our language filled with grace? Is our words bringing life into our situation and into others' situation? And also take a look at our life. Say, is there any way that pride is taking over us? Are we humble in our walk? So there are many areas that we need to take a look to ponder on and correct ourselves. Are we patient, being patient with ourselves and being patient with others? So we need to check ourselves so that we know that how well do our action reflect the faith that we proclaim? Are we Christ like in our nature? We need to look at and check. So, with that, we end this session. Okay, we will take a short break and we will come back uh, and we will uh, study on uh, first and second Peter. With that, we will end this session. We will join again for the second hour. Thank you so much. God bless. I'll end the session now. <laughs>